I'm really excited to be able to spend some time talking today about the 2030 commitment and um, what it's all about. Um, I'm sure a lot of the folks on the line, um, for those of, of you who, who may be in the program, um, can, can even uh, shed better light than I. But um, in, uh, in short, the AIA 2030 commitment um, is really designed to support the 2030 challenge and transform the practice of architecture in a way that's holistic, firm-wide, project-based, and data-driven. Those four bullets, I hope, feel like a common theme uh, among the, the discussion today, um, and I know it are also really important elements of some of the other programs that we'll hear about um, later on in the hour as well. Um, the, the initiative was, was started by Architecture 2030 in 2006, and Vincent, I see you on the line, um, so really delighted that um, uh, you may be able to answer some, some Q&A too. Uh, and um, in 2010, the AIA um, took the, the 2030 targets that Architecture 2030 developed to reach net zero carbon by 2030 and created a program around it to help build accountability and help firms track and measure progress towards those net zero carbon goals. As many folks on the line are familiar, built environment carbon emissions make up an enormous portion of the global carbon emissions pie. If you take a look on the right-hand side, the two green slices are the pieces um, that the built environment are responsible for, about 30% from building operations and operational energy, which is really the meat of what the 2030 commitment focuses on, and uh, about 11% from embodied carbon, the embodied carbon that's in the building materials and construction process um, as buildings are being constructed, which really represents the enormous opportunity that architecture engineering um, and construction firms have to, to make a difference and reduce the amount of carbon um, that goes into those two processes, both embodied carbon and operational carbon. Um, of course, that 30% building operations average is the average globally. So in a lot of cities and dense urban areas like here in Washington, DC or Boston, New York, uh, other cities have much higher portions of their overall carbon emissions budget coming from building operations um, as high as 70 and 80%. Um, so really an enormous piece of the puzzle, especially considering the fact that global building stock will double in the next 40 years, adding 1.5 trillion square feet. It really underscores the huge opportunity that architecture firms have to reduce operational energy of the building buildings that they design. And the 2030 commitment since it launched in 2010 um, has been having escalating targets towards full carbon neutrality by 2030. When the program launched in 2010, there was a target of 60%. It moved up to 70%. It's at 80% today. It'll increase to 90 by 2025. And of course, with the overall goal of reaching full carbon neutrality for projects that are being designed portfolio wide, regardless of where they are or what use type or how big or small. These are, of course, targets. And we understand understand that folks who are in the program or who are working towards the same goals, of course, may not have the opportunity to design projects every day that, you know, are, are achieving an 80% reduction of energy, um, of energy use intensity, the main metric that we track for whole building projects. But the intent is to be working towards those goals and from wherever you're starting at to make progress towards them. Um, it is certainly more challenging for some use types than others and in some climate zones than other, but what has been really exciting to see is over time, very meaningful growth towards that overall net zero carbon goal. From 2010 to today, um, folks in the program that are reporting projects have been able to reduce their predicted energy use intensity by just over half, which is really tremendous progress, but of course leaves a, a big way to, to go to reach full net zero. Um, it's exciting to see more and more individual individual projects meeting that 80% reduction target today and reaching full net zero carbon, um, but certainly a long way to go portfolio wide. For those who are not intimately acquainted with PEUI, predicted energy use intensity, um, essentially it's the amount of energy, site energy that a building is anticipated to use over the area. Um, that's kind of the, the simple metric that's required to be tracked for whole buildings in the program, but the program does accommodate interior only projects to be reported. Um, the main metric for interior projects is predicted lighting power density. You know, really in, in simple terms, the amount of watts uh, that lighting in a building is anticipated to use over the area as well. So um, folks report their projects through a platform that we offer a cloud-based tool called the Design Data Exchange or the DDX, which you may, may um, have had the chance to use before or poke around with before. Um, it's, it's a way that folks are able to 
create projects and track des uh, design data over every phrase from concept to construction documents and administration, as well as post occupancy data once a project is complete. By adding and creating projects in the DDX and reporting them every year, we help folks understand through a reports tab, different an analytics about the performance of their projects. And we take all of the data that's reported, we anonymize it and aggregate it and track how the industry is trending every year over time. Um, in terms of the projects that folks report, um, for whole building projects, it's really any whole building project where there is an impact to HVAC or an envelope modification for existing buildings or new construction that's of the whole building scale. For interior only projects, um, again, that's generally projects that have alterations to lighting design happening. Um, but folks, you know, throughout their entire portfolio typically report um, the vast majority, all that are active in, in any design phase above a certain threshold, usually will folks, uh, folks will set um, a, a specific square footage threshold that they'll report above. You know, this ranges from a few projects a year for our smallest sole proprietors to several thousand projects for our biggest firms that are reporting projects every year. Each year reporting happens between December 31st and March 31st and is for the year prior, just like taxes. And this is a snapshot of the most recent reporting period. Um, so in December, we released the results for the, the previous reporting period for 2020. Um, it, it has a couple of familiar numbers that we just looked at, that overall reduction of predicted energy use intensity by 51.3%. Um, out of the thousand or so firms that are in the program, about 378 submitted data. 15 met that 80% reduction target across their entire portfolio, which is really exciting to see that, that it is possible to achieve that level of performance across the board. Um, over 22,000 projects and 3.5 billion square feet reported. Um, a couple other helpful numbers that I, I won't go through one by one, but um, might be helpful to get a sense of the, the kind of progress that, that firms in the 2030 commitment are, are reaching and, and working towards. Um, we're in the process of crunching the numbers for 2021, the reporting period that just closed out this spring. And um, over the course of the year, of course, folks submit projects and create projects to, to track their progress and, and look at their own analytics uh, within the DDX as they go. A brief snapshot of the amount of projects that use energy modeling in the 2030 commitment, we really aim to help folks understand what their energy performance is anticipated to look like, whether they are submitting an energy model or not. So you can report and include projects that aren't modeled. We help folks understand their energy performance with code estimates, depending on the building code that they're designing to. But of course, we really strongly encourage energy modeling early and often and are exciting to see a humongous level of growth there over recent recent years, with about 77% of gross square footage today being reported, up from 40% just a few years ago, which is, is really tremendous to see. On the, on the right, a, a brief glimpse at the, the buildings by gross square footage reported that have uh, gone fully electric or majority electric, which, as we all know, is such a key to, uh, to reducing total carbon. Knowing that this group in particular here has a lot of vested interest and enthusiasm for embodied carbon, wanted to touch on this piece in particular um, in the last couple of minutes here before handing it off to, to Chris on the SE 2050 side. Um, as I mentioned, the 2030 commitment has really been grounded in operational energy historically over the dozen years that it's been in existence. Um, so most projects are reporting only that operational energy today, but we were incredibly excited to launch the ability to track and report embodied carbon two years ago. So we just had the second reporting period where firms were able to report projects with embodied carbon. A brief snapshot of what this looks like in our tool on the right hand side. Someone selects what kind of LCA tool they use, the scope and stages that were included, whether biogenic carbon was included or not. The first year that we offered embodied carbon reporting, about 291 projects reported of just about 63 million gross square feet. In 2021, the, the period that we're crunching numbers on actively, we're really excited to share more detailed findings than, than we have in the past with the number of projects more than tripling that have reported embodied carbon. And for a, a brief glimpse um, to, to end on on the embodied carbon side in terms of the numbers that uh, that we are seeing um, a, a glimpse here. Um, really excited to see that some projects are reporting um, to be net positive in terms of embodied carbon, which is a tremendous achievement, um, as well as as uh, those that that veer up on the on the higher side. 
Um, we definitely know that there is a, a big learning curve with transitioning to reporting embodied carbon, but have been so thrilled to see many firms, large and small, dip their toe into it the first year or two it's been offered, and a lot of firms that are considering expanding to reporting embodied carbon portfolio-wide, just as they, over the last handful of years, have transitioned to reporting energy modeling portfolio-wide, uh, which certainly a lot of firms are, are still in the throes of today, knowing that uh, by project count, while we have 77% of gross square footage reporting energy models today, by project count, it's about one in two. Um, so certainly understand that it's not every project someone's going to be able to report and do an LCA and report embodied carbon on or report an energy model, do energy modeling on. But it's it's been really thrilling to see meaningful increases on both of those fronts and, and to see a lot of progress within each firm as well as the program writ large. But I'll stop there knowing I think I'm just a minute or two over time, Dave. I, I don't want to intrude farther onto, onto Chris's time, um, but really excited to, to learn more about the SE 2050 and contractor commitment side and, and answer any and all questions um, down the line this hour. Mm -hmm.